absolutely wonderful to be back at the University of Washington. Uh, my dad reminds me that I don't come back to Seattle quite often enough, so it's great to be here. Um, hopefully you'll be entertained. I have lots of pictures, uh, a few videos, and uh, we'll get through it um, in a kind of a quick manner. Uh, I wanted to at least prove to you I was at the, in the Seattle area, so this is me at Schmitz Park. I might add that uh, the year I, I was supposed to go to kindergarten, uh, the bond didn't pass, so I didn't make it. We didn't have kindergarten, and I didn't go to kindergarten uh, at Schmitz Park. Uh, but that's me flying a T-28 airplane that was on a stick. I, that flew exactly one time, went straight up, straight down, shattered into pieces, and that was the end of it. Uh, my family, my dad uh, was, worked for Boeing all his uh, life. Um, we used to go to ocean shores and dig clams. I wasn't any good at that, so, but I was good at skimboarding, and that was me uh, skimboarding. Uh, I do uh, have a lot, kind of a high energy profile in life, and uh, wasn't really afraid of a lot, and it was great to climb trees in, in the West Seattle area. Uh, I don't know how many, anybody build a Heath kit? Does anyone remember that? <laughs> it's great to be among friends. Um, I built this Heath kit uh, amplifier, with, uh, I finally talked my dad into uh, allowing me to use the soldering iron and built this amplifier. It had maybe 500 cold solder joints and really never sounded very good, but it was a good experience. <laughs> I did go to Big Bend Community College. Uh, I told my dad I wanted to learn to fly. Big Bend had that capability and I went there to learn to fly and uh, that was the first time I flew a seaplane. I was actually vice president of the seaplane club, my first title in life and uh, all good fun, and uh, flew in the potholes in, uh, in Moses Lake. Uh, and then when I went, came over to the University of Washington, uh, really needed to, to help myself through college, so uh, I worked for Kenmore Air Harbor, and you see those, uh, those seaplanes flying around here. Uh, the interesting fact that, uh, is that in those days, we flew off glaciers. We flew off the Olympic Glacier and the Cascade Glacier, uh, and that was as, as dangerous a thing as I've ever done in my life. Uh, but it was a lot of fun, too, so um, did that uh, to put myself through school. I also had a, a scholarship. Anybody from Boeing? Any Boeing people? Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, I wouldn't be here if Boeing uh, hadn't given me a full scholarship to get through college because it was too hard to work uh, to put yourself through school and go to Boeing. Let's give a hand to Boeing. Uh, Why did I go in the Navy? I was looking for fun and I uh, wanted to see the world and uh, when I told my dad I was going to go in the Navy to fly, he said, well, I guess you could do that and then you could come back and work for Boeing. <laughs> so, uh, but I did go in the Navy uh, and, and this is, uh, I gave a talk to some kids, uh, some kids, some students and uh, my advice to them is stay out of, you know, stay out of your comfort zone a lot and uh, this was his, uh, this is Never even been uh, anywhere near Pensacola, and I got off the plane, and I could barely breathe because of the humidity. So uh, it was June of uh, 77, and never actually made the, uh, the uh, graduation here because I was off to go into the Navy. I uh, flew a T-28, the same one I crashed on the string. I actually flew that in the Navy, um, pretty big uh, compared to me. And then... Uh, had my first choice to go wherever I wanted in the Navy, so I chose to fly A6 intruders out of Whidbey Island and be near home in Seattle and my parents, so uh, I got a chance to do that. Little did I know, though, that in the Navy, you're really never actually home. You're really, your home is aircraft carriers, and so I was really on an aircraft carrier far more than I was ever at Whidbey Island. Uh, did own a home, though, but uh, wasn't there a whole lot. Uh, you know, people ask me, when did you want to be an astronaut? And uh, I can tell you that I, I was getting on a uh, 747 out of SeaTac, going to Hawaii to meet the USS Kitty Hawk, CV-63, and my first cruise as a, a Navy pilot. And uh, somebody had a transistor radio right in the air. They were listening, and I said, what are you listening to? And they said, oh, they're landing the shuttle. John Young's landing the shuttle. So right then, I said, that sounds like a cool job. And... Uh, so as I walked on that 747, I thought, well, if I want to be a shuttle pilot, I need to be a test pilot. So 
applied to test pilot school, uh, got lucky enough as a Navy guy to go to Air Force test pilot school. And uh, does anybody know who is giving me my diploma there? Mike Collins, Apollo 11. Uh, great guy, and um, it turns out my, uh, my older son uh, is a Navy F-18 pilot. He is now at Edwards Air Force Base going through test pilot school, and his graduation speaker is gonna be me, so he, <laughs> de he doesn't get Michael Collins. I got a chance to fly the, uh, the Navy's newest fighter then, the F-18, went straight uphill, it ex accelerates vertically. Um, it was a, a, very, uh, a very powerful airplane, a very capable airplane, and was neat to be in the mid-80s flying an airplane for the first time that uh, the Navy had just gotten. Uh, I also uh, left the Navy and became a NASA research pilot and had an interview. I would tell you that uh, very few people become astronauts on the first interview, and that was not me, nor was it on the second interview, but it was on the third. Uh, but they offered me a job as a research pilot down at NASA, and uh, I flew the KC-135, the Vomit Comet, where we did microgravity research. I also flew a high-altitude research airplane uh, in the 75,000-foot range uh, doing uh, some classified testing. So I uh, got a chance to be a NASA research pilot, and uh, that was a broadening experience for me. We'll talk about the Hubble Servicing Mission uh, 4. Turns out there's been five missions, but we call it four because we want to confuse you all. Uh, there's a mission 3A and 3B, and, uh, but I got lucky enough to be on this, and I, I can tell you that um, this is the mission I wanted because it's so science-oriented. Uh, the payoff is, is pretty high for the American public for the money they put into it. Uh, Hubble has discovered the acceleration of the universe. It discovered black holes that were hypothesized. Uh, but it has done about 50% of its discoveries are discoveries were not expected. So it's been a, very, a big payoff for uh, America. This is uh, Michael Griffin, Griffin, our former administrator. Uh, he, was, uh, he has six degrees, uh, none from the UW though, um, but a very smart uh, individual and uh, a friend of the Hubble. And so the, uh, the original Hubble mission was canceled due to risk. Uh, Mike Griffin uh, wanted to add the mission on, and he eventually did so uh, by adding a safety shuttle on the other launch pad. So uh, because of our inclination, they would have to rescue us with another shuttle. So why have a Hubble? Uh, this is probably the best uh, reason is we have a huge universe out there. It's about 13.7 billion years old, and Hubble's out looking at the universe and trying to decide what's in between those galaxies and stars. And, and that is really why we have the Hubble today. Um, we call this the ultimate Copernican uh, re revolution. Uh, it's not only, we're not the center of the universe, we're not even made of what 96% of the universe is made of, and we don't understand it. And that's really why we have um, Hubble and what we're trying to understand in the universe there. We got assigned on Halloween of uh, 2006 um, I'll just point my classmates there. Uh, Megan MacArthur right here, PhD in oceanography. Started out in aero though, so we, we can have aero conversations. Colonel Mike Good, uh, Notre Dame, uh, bachelor's and master's, um, also a, um, a test engineer for the United States Air Force. Then you've got myself as a Navy test pilot. Uh, Scott Altman, also a Navy test pilot as the commander of the mission. Uh, Scooter flew the uh, Anybody seen the movie Top Gun? Scooter flew the, the, the F-14 uh, pieces in Top Gun. And uh, we, then we have John Grunsfeld. Uh, Scooter has been into space three times. This, that was his fourth mission. Uh, John four times. This is his fifth and his third to Hubble. Hubble is our, uh, John is our, uh, with a PhD in astrophysics, is our uh, Hubble expert. Uh, followed up by Mike Massimino, five degrees, uh, PhD in robotics and uh, second time to Hubble, and Drew Foistel, a PhD in uh, geophysics, and a, a certified uh, really good car guy, and really good with his hands, uh, and, and a very talented individual. So that rounded out the crew. We were sort of hand-picked by the administrator uh, and uh, with the idea that we wouldn't screw it up. So here's Hubble. I think we all know it uh, pretty well. It's got two solar arrays. 
No uh, propellant on Hubble. It all uses uh, reaction wheels to uh, move, maneuver itself around. 26,500 pounds. It's about the size of a school bus. It's up at 306 miles, which is as high as we can go with the shuttle and still get back uh, in a 28 and a half degree inclination. And on our mission, STS-125, we flew five EVAs on an 11-day mission, planned 11-day mission, ended up being 13 due to um, bad weather at the Cape. So what's new about Hubble? We had two new instruments, a wide field camera three and a cosmic origin spectrograph. The spectrograph decides what's in between the intergalactic medium in the uh, universe. And then we had two broken instruments, uh, space telescope uh, imp imaging spectrograph that was, uh, had a bad power supply and it was completely dead. And then advanced camera for surveys had a 40, uh, uh, huge short on it, a 40 amp short, and then went dead, don't know what happened. And so that was our challenge, is to put in these two new instruments, fix these two, and do some upgrades to Hubble. So a little bit about Hubble himself. Uh, you know, Einstein figured it all out on the, on the blackboard, and Hubble looked at it through his telescope and Mount Wilson, and they had a conversation together, and it pretty much went like this. Uh, you know, Einstein and, and some will know that the, the theory, but Einstein had you know, a constant he wasn't sure about, and Hubble said, well, you know, it, it surely looks like the universe is expanding, and they, they conferred and, and had that talk, and sure enough, the universe is expanding. Later on in life, we heard that not only is it expanding, but it's accelerating away from us, and, and that's the part that Hubble, probably the single largest discovery in my lifetime in the largest picture, certainly there's lots of great discoveries, but in the large picture, that the universe is expanding and accelerating, and uh, that came out of the Hubble Space Telescope. So let's just go back a little bit over the missions here, STS-90, our current administrator, Charlie Bolden, who was the pilot on that mission, so maybe there's hope for me to be administrator of NASA. Uh, they launched uh, Hubble out of the payload bay in 1990, and of course we all know it had a spherical aberration in the mirror. So in 1993, we fixed that, with something called COSTAR, which is corrective optics for, uh, for the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, it, so it went in 1993, it took three years. They also did put in a new wide field camera too, some new rate sensor units, and uh, you'll hear some of those terms as we go through some of the upgrades that went through uh, Hubble since 1990. Then we went into STS-82 on the servicing mission two. We added this uh, imaging spectrograph, uh, near-infrared uh, instrument, fine guidance sensor they fixed, and some other things that they worked uh, through that mission. So kind of just an upgrade to it with a couple uh, uh, upgrades. Then we went into SDS-103. Uh, you can see John Grunsfeld right here uh, on that mission. They did rate sensor units, fine guidance sensor, and some other uh, cats and dogs. And it's kind of interesting that in order to avoid Y2K, they landed them on December 26th, just so we did not have <laughs> the Hubble, the shuttle stop working uh, up there. So that's kind of an interesting unit uh, flight. And then STS-109, there's Scooter as the commander. Uh, then you see uh, John Grunsfeld up there and Mike Massimino, and they did all these things, uh, new solar arrays and dial boxes. They actually took the original solar arrays and just threw them overboard. And then they had uh, installed the advanced camera for surveys, the one that gives you some of the most beautiful pictures we've seen to date, and then some, uh, some other things they did to, uh, to fix it. And probably the most interesting is this uh, power control unit here. They actually completely powered down Hubble, and if they did that wrong, it would never work again, and then they powered it back up, and John was involved in that uh, spacewalk. So here we are at Atlantis and Endeavor ready to launch. Um, you can see Atlantis here, and then off in the, in the background is Endeavor on the opposite launch pad, and that's the first time we've ever had a standby shuttle, and this is due to the risk of the mission. Uh, so it was quite a capability for NASA to get two shuttles together at once. So talk just briefly about the Hubble rescue mission, and, and uh, the concept was is that the, uh, we would be out here hanging out, basically powered down, completely powered down with no... Uh, essentially no air, uh, you know, no heating, um, and we would be eating power bars and, and things like that. 
and the other rescue orbiter would come up, we would hook our uh, uh, robotic arms together, and then we would transfer from here along the robotic arms to the other airplane, the other vehicle. So that was the concept. Uh, why did we have to do that? As originally, the mission was canceled in 04 due to the risk too high. And because of the inclination, we can't get to the International Space Station until it takes too much delta V to get there. So uh, we added the mission on with our new administrator and uh, with a rescue orbiter. We put on 25 days of supplies, both food bars, clothes, and CO2 scrubber. Uh, the limiting consumable was the CO2. And then uh, if we had damage that we discovered on flight day nine, we would just barely be able to be rescued, assuming we got a second shuttle off the pad. Um, loss of crew and vehicle risk is one in 78. Uh, due to the micrometer at, uh, debris at the altitude Hubble's at and the inclination. So the big plan was launch another shuttle on the second day rendezvous, which is a day earlier than normal, and then we transfer over in a series of three EVAs. So on that plan, we were go, for, go to plan the mission. And this is what we did on our mission here. We did wide field camera three in, uh, the cosmic origin spectrograph, changed out the RSUs, replaced a box that had failed, the, the command and data handling box had failed. This is the one that sends all the information to the ground. Uh, we put in new batteries, which were original equipment, repaired two instruments, which was circuit card repair, never done in space before, put in a fine guidance sensor, some new insulation, and finally a soft capture mechanism, the ability to deorbit Hubble at the end of its lifetime with a robotic vehicle. So go up robotically attached to Hubble and deorbit because if Hubble comes down, uh, parts are gonna make it to the ground that are too big. And so, uh, and you can't predict when it's gonna come down. So that was the, that's the idea for our mission, STS-125 servicing mission four. If you told me at the start of the mission, I would have told you we probably could get about 80% of that done. In the end, we got it all done. And uh, it wasn't an easy task, but it was certainly a fun task and a challenging task. So here's our uh, public affairs poster for, for those of who's out there public affairs. Uh, Mike Massimino uh, has got a pretty good New York uh, sense of humor, and he came up with this. And so I'm right here, and I assimilate Matt Damon. So <laughs> I, I, and I, I, I find that to be just fine. Let's see, as a team, uh, we went out at a National Outdoor Leadership School in Alaska for nine days and uh, kayaked around Alaska under some fairly stressful conditions, all planned by NASA to get us to team build and find the strengths and weaknesses of everybody. Um, and so we're at a glacier in Alaska there, and one of our team members is on the other side of the, the, the he wasn't there in this picture, but um, it was a very good team building exercise and I highly rec recommend it for the Dean of Engineering to do that with all of his faculty someday. So. Let's see, we went to, went to work at Hubble classes and uh, the, I, I took this picture because we weren't, there was no smiling here. There was no smiling because there was a lot of technical challenges that were difficult to overcome and we overcame them by designing 120 new tools to take up and fix Hubble. And uh, it was that tool design that was critical in order to get this all done in a very quick period of time. And uh, you can see our commander there, fairly stern-faced as he's, he's responsible for the mission. And, and if it doesn't go well, it's uh, you know, him, and then it rolls down to us. But um, I, just, I remember that uh, particular meeting at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Baltimore. Uh, we practiced our EVAs in the, uh, the pool at the Johnson Space Center. This is a pool with six million gallons of water. Uh, Hubble exists underneath the water. So does the International Space Station, I might add, that we, we assemble underneath the water. And so our spacewalkers do all their, their sort of uh, zero gravity simulation in under, underneath the water. And then we have a number of divers that help them when uh, they have to work against the inertia of the water. And it's very tiring. So. This is a picture of um, Mass and I trying to uh, uh, put the gloves on John and uh, suit him up. And, and that's what I did on orbit is get the guys out the door for the, the spacewalks. Of course, the, the commander, myself, and Megan, the, uh, Megan MacArthur, the uh, uh, flight engineer, uh, did the uh, integrated sims. And, and you can't see all the screens here, but you can at least see two, four, uh, five screens, six, seven. Well, there's two more over here. 
So the screen's everywhere, and all that is the data that takes us to get into orbit. And uh, so we're doing uh, our sims in our uh, orange suits, which is much harder than doing it, say, in this flight suit. Uh, but we do that, quite a bit of ascent entry uh, similar training. It turns out uh, on the day of launch that, that came in handy. This is me flying the uh, a shuttle training aircraft. It's a highly modified Gulfstream II. We do 18 degree glides, dives at about 10,000 feet uh, per minute dive rate. And uh, then we uh, flare out at, uh, and land at 205 knots and put the, the chute out. There's me heading to meetings with uh, Bueno. Uh, and we do that in our, normally in our little jets. And uh, that keeps me current as a pilot. And uh, we can get to meetings pretty fast in a jet. So. We get a chance to do that, and that's, I would say, one of the big perks of the job. <laughs> uh, we also tasted food. Uh, I can honestly tell you, got to orbit. Didn't really feel like eating, actually. All that fluid shifts and uh, eating wasn't a big thing. I lost about four pounds in, you know, 13 days. So you're, you're shedding, uh, people lost weight quite a bit. But they gave us a chance to taste all this food and see what you like. There's my uh, wife and I on the launch pad the day before launch, and um, Annette is a uh, mechanical engineer for NASA, and then you can see the launch pad. We're on our pad, our launch pad, and then the safety vehicle's on the other one there. And this is the crew and their families. Uh, right across this road is all our other families. We go into quarantine a, uh, a week in advance so we don't get a cold and, and uh, go up into space with a cold. And so we're, we're with our families. Our family members get a physical so they don't give us a cold. And, uh, but that's about all we can see. And so we see them uh, in quarantine there. And there's the, all the kids <laughs> for the families. And they all draw a picture um, that they, they put in the launch control center that's there for uh, the STS-125. Well, it was go time for Atlantis. I certainly was ready to go. I tell you, uh, this seven-month delay of the uh, command and data handling was just about enough to, uh, <clears throat> to test my patience, and I usually have quite a bit. Uh, I, I told the, the dean at a, a little a group meeting uh, just before this that um, we were in a sim about two weeks prior to launch. I had mentally checked out at home, and uh, some people, some spouses will call NASA not a spouse anymore. And uh, I certainly wasn't a spouse at two weeks prior to launch. I was getting ready, I had my game face on, and uh, Hubble had this failure, and uh, I sent my wife, uh, I was the social chairman for the crew, so I sent my wife a Blackberry saying, um, pick out a place we need to have margaritas, everybody's pretty down, myself included, and she was too, because she had to explain to 300 guests why we're not going in two weeks. And so they all had to change for a seven month delay. But we finally got to the go point. Uh, there's my game face on May 11, 2009, and we landed uh, just about almost 13 days later there. The crew headed to launch pad 39A. Uh, we, we rolled out, they actually, uh, shot an IMAX video of this, this and, and I shot an IMAX video on the flight, so um, that'll come out in March of next year, but um, they wanted to turn around and wave, so we gave them the proverbial wave. So let me go through the, uh, the liftoff, and we have a little bit of sound, and um, if you kind of listen closely, you'll be able to hear the, um, some of the conversation between Scooter and I, uh, at one second, the, uh, one of the four flight control channels shorted out. And so you'll hear that comment of uh, uh, good with the roll program, we see the flight control channel. I, my original thought was, oh, that's on his side. Scooter has his problems, I got mine. Mine are main engines. And 30 seconds later, we had a main engine issue. Look, it was only a transducer, but it was enough to give me a uh, stop my heart for a second. So uh, here's the launch and a little bit of crew interview at the end. Right, let's go. Turn up the volume just a little bit. Launch, GNC. Go. Payloads. Go. Guidance. Go. Fido. Go. Prop. Go. GNC. Go. Max. Go. Eagle. Go. Ecom. Go. Seven. Six. Liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, the final visit to enhance the vision of Hubble into the deepest grandeur of our universe. Houston Atlantis, small program with the FCS channel. Bypass across the board, scooter, no action. Okay, got LBLH, Ranger? I do. I see him in the bucket. Hey. 
Hornet 71. Atlantis on its way, all three engines now throttling down as the area begins as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Atlantis, two ten, no action on the MPF two out two. Houston, copy, no action. Back at 104, scooter. Houston, you are go for orbit ops. Houston, Atlantis, good words. Go for orbit ops. Thank you. Hey, Ray J. How you doing? Hey, Welcome Ryan. to orbit. It's great to be here, Doug. How was that ride? Uh, it was wild, basically. Hello, man. Mike, good. First day in space. How's it going? First full day. You already had, you know, you, let, you blasted off yesterday. How are you feeling today? Feeling much better today. Yeah, it's a very exciting liftoff and yes. uh, trip to space. Here we are. Had a little sleep. Had a little chow. Oh, great. We're doing our work here, getting the airlock ready so we can go outside and do EVAs. All right, which That's is why we're here. All right, hey Drew, how was your first day in space? Uh, it was good. Yeah, I enjoyed it. You were unbelievable, man. You were working like a maniac right from this get-go. Like you, you know, you were born here. I like this floating in space. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? It's a ride. Do a flip for your family and friends. Let's see if I can. Can you do that? Slowly. Slowly. Oh, that's excellent. So has this met your expectations? Yeah, exceeded. Really? Oh yeah, by far exceeded them. Well, you're doing great, man. Thanks, buddy. The ride was, man, that was some ride. That was some, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of fun during yeah, that asset. We, we did have some we? fun, yeah. Those singing three, songs singing and songs. screaming and yelling. Those three G's kicked in and uh, oh, I was ready for yeah, that baby. to be over. That was fun though, wasn't it? Man. I'll remember that. It was awesome. Okay, so uh, that was ascent. When we got to altitude, there this is a this is a uh, a picture of my ohms propellant, and we had 52, 53 on uh, each side. Of course, that's how much you need. You need 50% to get back. So uh, I was trying to look at that, and I, they had told me this was going to occur, but it was just if we didn't, if one of these didn't work, uh, that would be really bad. So <laughs> we made it though. Let's see, we had a robotic arm here. Uh, this is the robotic arm, and then this is a boom, and on the end of the boom is a laser, and we kind of use that to look at our leading edge and our tile underneath. So that's the, the inspection we now have to do after the Columbia accident. It's kind of a good picture of the cockpit because it kind of shows, uh, you've got a laptop here, and uh, this is my seat here, the pilot's seat, and that's actually my Navy wings. A scooter actually gave me those that have Navy wings as an astronaut are slightly different, so he gave me one of those, those little uh, um, name tags. And then you can see checklists around and all this wiring and you know timers and everything, and that's exactly kind of like a big um, camping trip. This is Scooter looking out the uh, overhead uh, for the rendezvous, uh, which occurred on uh, flight day three. And this is me in the left seat doing the burns coming up to the rendezvous, and then Scooter hand flies it uh, in the last uh, 600 feet or so. Actually, uh, about 1,500 feet is hand flown, so he's, he's doing that. So we'll do just a uh, quick look at the, uh, the rendezvous because this is, uh, it kind of shows how it occurs, and, and it's not real obvious. It's got this little kind of goofy start, so just bear with me on this. Because all of a sudden a shuttle will come flying by the earth here. There it is. <laughs> so this is it. We, we come up from underneath in uh, rendezvous with Hubble. and kind of see it from below there. And then Megan comes out and grasps the Hubble, and then we lower it into the payload bay on a a circular rotating structure, and then we're able to move Hubble around in a circle. Okay, so we finally got Hubble after seven years, uh, and then we went right to work on it. Um, my job was to take, I took 1,300 pictures of Hubble for the engineers that wanted to look and see how much uh, micrometeorite debris it, it hit in any areas that, that could uh, kind of give them a clue to why we lost two of the instruments there. Uh, of course, spacewalks occurred next, and uh, trying to get people 
as they're floating into these suits is really difficult to do because it takes quite a bit of energy to get your feet in there. And so that's uh, me helping out Drew in his first spacewalk. Now we'll talk a little bit about the EVA uh, animation. This shows all the stuff we did and it, it makes a, a kind of a great video. So I, I show this up front because it, then I don't have to explain it quite as hard. So here we go. First thing we do is, uh, this shows is the, doing the batteries right up here. And we eliminated those battery modules, 600 pounds each, and stuck some more in, actually put three in. Then we moved on to wide field camera uh, two came out and stuck in wide field camera three. That bolt almost didn't come out, so we almost didn't get that accomplished. And then we stuck out these three rate sensor units, the limiting life of Hubble, and put three in. Very difficult to do. That door almost didn't close. All uh, challenges. Opened this up, took out the corrective optics CoStar, didn't need it anymore, and put in COS. And then we uh, fixed one of the instruments here, uh, took all the circuit cards out and uh, for ACS. Rotated it around, and then we fixed the uh, STIS, the uh, imaging spectrograph, took that off and the card out, and then uh, stuck another circuit card in there. Never been done before. Right here, find guidance sensor on the side. And that came out and uh, put another one in. And then finally we did um, put on the soft capture mechanism on the bottom of Hubble right here. And this is how um, we will be able to uh, robotically attach to it and then deorbit it in the future if we need to do so. So this is a good picture of Whitefield Camera 3 um, coming out there, a real big kind of piano sized camera. Uh, this is just a, a fun picture of me and uh, Mike Massimino at the back window uh, saying hi. Uh, then we did the, the science, uh, command and dating handling, data handling system, and uh, that's way up on the side, and uh, we uh, went ahead and took some pictures. The, the spacewalkers actually have cameras with them, so they're able to take pictures if they get a chance to. Um, this is the uh, taking out the CoStar, and then we put the new uh, uh, COS in there, and this is the spacewalker inside there. This is how we fixed the, the uh, imaging uh, spectrograph. This is the one that had um, a circuit card that needed to come out. And this is, um, there were 117 tiny screws and, uh, that had to come out, but not get lost or go into the telescope. And so we, the way we, that was designed was Goddard came up with this um, capture, soft capture mechanism, um, and then we, went ahead and put that over the top and undid every one of those screws and that pulled, it captured all of the, um, the screws and we were able to take it all off and then uh, take out the circuit card, put a new cover on and then continue and that all worked. And so that was uh, pretty, uh, sort of like brain surgery on orbit. This is just kind of cool to show um, Sunrise and sunsets every 90 minutes. The sun comes up, it's extremely uh, bright. Uh, and it just shows uh, our spacewalkers here on the end of the robotic arm doing spacewalking in the dark, which you have to do, just constantly do that. So it's not only a distraction to do it in the dark, but it's a distraction when you go over Australia and Hawaii and you know, you're looking at, the, if you look down at the ground, you know, you wanna look outside a little more and they got a lot to do out there. So this is a good uh, example of them hanging out, putting in that fine guidance sensor on the side. Um, although it looks like they're just hanging on the side, they're actually tethered. Uh, so, so they somehow let go, they, they're able to be safely tethered. This is Megan, our prime robotics operator. Um, she had some help, but she did most of the robotics for the flight. And uh, so she had her little corner in the back window and she was able to uh, move our, our uh, robotics EVA crew members around. This is me with my space smile. Um, you know, once you get on orbit, it's hard to quit smile, and I generally smile anyway, but um, it's really true that uh, when you're up there, it's just really a blast, and it's a great team effort. Um, even though you're working 17 or 18 hour days, uh, it's a great day, it's a great team effort. This is kind of hanging out. Um, <laughs> these are drink bags, and uh, Megan's just upside down. You know, you're, 
it, it just takes about a day to reorientate yourself and you know you can see everything everything every wall you know the ceiling you can hang out of the ceiling you can do whatever you want it's all doable they're all spaces so it doesn't seem like you're in such a small area because you can you can hang out on all edges so <laughs> so we'll just uh, this is me exercise and we'll show this video um, I had to exercise uh, all the, the the commander the pilot and the uh, flight engineer the scooter really wanted us to exercise because we had to be able to land the shuttle at the end of this, and you definitely are degraded when you re-enter. So, so there's a little interview here with me. Hardest working guy on the flight deck. You're doing an awesome job with all the photo TV, keeping the orbiter running. Uh, Well-deserved break here. Where, where, where are you riding right now? Well, uh, I'm, I'm trying to ride from uh, all the way across Australia and then uh, through the Pacific, uh, so that's my ride plan right now for about 30 minutes. And it's going well. I mean, I'm making some time at 17,500 miles an hour. Excellent. <laughs> You're moving. You enjoy going around interviewing people like that? Yes, it's fun. It is fun, isn't it? Yes. I don't like being are interviewed, you, though. Are you a great interview subject? <laughs> Tell me no. an interesting anecdote about your spacewalk. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> How did this one compare? Do you, do you get do you get tired of coming? Is there anything that lets, is oh hum about it, or is it still just you know the, the greatest thing for you when you come up here? You know, I'd say it was the greatest thing, but the fact is, I get really tired of these crew interviews. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just insane. That wasn't my question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't space talking about the crew flight. interview. I was talking space about the space flight, flight part of no, it. No, you never get tired of space flight. I love being up here. Uh, as soon as we get to main engine cutoff, suddenly I get this big grin on my face. Usually it stays the yeah. whole flight, uh, except for some scary moments during EVA when people have to break off handrails. Yeah. But, uh, the rest of the time, you know, I just love being up here. No, it's very comfortable. You just get your sleeping bag and you tie yourself off to the wall and you just uh, float yeah. off to sleep, literally. Yeah. It's very comfortable. Like the best water bed in the world. Just kind of hand out your float. What about you, Meg? You ready to come back? You know, I'd, I will miss floating. If I could float around in my house at home, that'd be awesome. It's a really easy, you know, it makes everything really easy. Yeah. You just can get everywhere. You get to the ceiling, yeah. you get to the floor and the top of the wall and everything. What about so, the bruises? The bruises, yeah. <laughs> it took me a couple of days to adjust to the rate that you need to move. And so stopping yeah. yourself sometimes involves <laughs> bruising yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we, we did have a couple of, uh, we had Curious George up there with us, the space monkey. Uh, and we put him in the window sometimes to, to show him to the space uh, spacewalker. So that's me with Curious George there. Um, you know, I, uh, they told me the best, thing, best idea is using an electric shaver. Well, that didn't really work very well. And we did all these crew interviews and really didn't have a good shave. But uh, that's me with my Husky shirt on uh, using my electric shaver that I think has been way too used too much. So I ended up having to manually shave on orbit. Uh, but I'm taking a picture of that. Um, in the back there is the, uh, the airlock, which is where we start to go out the door, and this is just me doing a Superman uh, flying through it. And you might think, well, where'd you have time to do all this? And it's really because we waved off two days, and we were on orbit for two days with essentially nothing to do. And so um, one of the things we did, they, they uplinked to us the uh, brand new Star Trek movie. Now, this had not come out to all of you. But it came up to us in, uh, in, group, in eight segments. And uh, the night before this, the first scheduled landing, we started watching the Star Trek movie. We got ahead. And, and uh, then it was time to go to bed. And so we asked Dad, can we stay up? And uh, of course, he had to land the next day. And, and I did too with him. And I and, uh, said, oh, OK, I'm probably not going to sleep well anyway. So we stayed up and watched Star Trek. So that was uh, really neat. The next day that we waved off, um, somebody pulled out Apollo 13 when we watched that, so <laughs> people stuck in space. This is the, uh, our official crew photo, and, and I tell you, that, you know, this might look like it's easy to take, but it's really hard when all of you are floating. And so, um, and the commander, who is literally like 6'3", and I'm like 5'6", really didn't like me floating higher than him, so. Uh, <laughs> I say that nicely. He's just a wonderful individual. But um, it took quite a few clicks of this. And uh, the, the interesting thing about this is this, this picture took way too long. It was taking way too long. And uh, I had lost track of time. But the next thing we were going to do is this event, testifying in front of the Senate. And I had not set up with that. 
set up the, the video for that. And this is Senator Mikulski from, you know, from uh, Maryland. So it was, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, we're, you know, and she's waiting and she's pretty powerful and controls the appropriations for NASA. So, so that this, this uh, photo took way too long. So let's see, photographing the Earth, we did a lot of that. I did some myself. This is a good picture from 306 nautical miles up. And I would just tell you that if you're not an environmentalist, after you go into space, you will be. Um, the, the, the Earth is very fragile. Uh, the difference between the Amazon and the Nile, for example, is just starkly contrasted. And uh, you look at that and you, you know you need to protect the Earth. So that's my environmental message for the evening. This is my wife in Mission Control. Uh, we didn't do this all alone. And uh, we had a huge group of people on the ground. It was a huge team effort. We were at the front end of it, but I can tell you that... Uh, there's an awful lot of people who, have, uh, who are Hubble huggers and who uh, made this mission a success. And this is my wife in mission control, uh, making sure everybody does the right thing. And, and her people do the right thing. She's the manager for NASA and the Orbiter Project. So she's sitting in uh, mission control there. Took a lot of pictures of the, the, uh, the Earth. And uh, Mount Everest is right down in here. Uh, I tell people, I wish I had studied my geography a little better because honestly, I could not look out the window and tell you exactly where you were, where John Grunsfeld had been, you know, four other times before. He knew exactly where we were over the Earth. And so um, at five miles a second, though, you're going pretty fast. So taking pictures of things uh, goes pretty quick. Uh, we did have to take care of Atlantis. Uh, I'm doing some uh, vacuuming there. Scooter's changing out these Lyle canisters, the ones that scrub the CO2. And Megan is actually, uh, we had a problem with water, uh, and Megan is making a a uh, makeshift tool to get some water out underneath the, the mid-deck floor. We did have an orbit, uh, on-orbit phone call with the president, and it was pretty cool. Um, he, he'd ask us to look outside and see if they're mowing his lawn, because he wasn't in town. And uh, <laughs> I said, <laughs> we didn't, I said, well, we, we actually can't see DC from our orbit. Uh, and then we, uh, he was going to announce the administrator, the new administrator, the next week, and we asked him, well, you know, we're just up here, it's just us. Just us and you. Of course, there's a huge group that's taping this, and you know the ground is listening. And uh, maybe you could just tell us in advance. And he said, no, he had had to do it with fanfare, and so he didn't offer who the the new administrator was. Uh, this is the the testifying to uh, Senator Mikulski here uh, that I was way behind, but we got it done like a minute to spare. And she would not be happy, I don't think, if we were off uh, with Senator Nelson. Uh, sleeping in space was. Uh, Pretty easy to do. You just floated there, um, and uh, because you know the, the sun comes out, you know every orbit, uh, you had to put on wear eye shades. And then we did wear earplugs because it was a little bit loud. But uh, I slept behind the the in the the cockpit, the upper flight deck. Scooter and I slept up there, and then the the MS has slept down in the the mid deck there. You know, stupid astronaut tricks. This is Drew. He's got a big water bottle that he's a uh, water bubble that he's squeezed out, and then he's looking through it. And so, <laughs> kids like that, so we show that. Uh, we did release Hubble. Uh, this is uh, me looking out the window. This is Drew with a handheld laser as it flew away, and then we did burns and basically just pulled away from Hubble. We Megan let it go with a robotic arm. We retracted the arm, and then we just powered ourselves down with thruster jets and got away from it, and then burned. <coughs> Uh, did a burn to uh, separate. And then we, we say it's ready to unlock the secrets of the universe because that's what Hubble does. Uh, this is kind of cool. It was sunrise off the tail. And that's kind of the thin blue, blue line. And, and uh, I w if you could all experience space, it would be to, s to see the sunrises and sunsets. They're just absolutely magnificent. Uh, of course, we, I told you we only had 50% ohms prop, and we wanted to do this burn right and make it home. So uh, that's, and the burns, the ohms per system is my system, the orbital maneuvering system. So doing this right was very important. So I'm studying up for the burn in my suit as we uh, get ready to deorbit. Once you do the burn, it's about one hour, and you're uh, back on deck. And so we'll uh, show this video uh, with another crew interview of uh, getting ready to land. Both of you have very pivotal roles in landing. Greg, why don't you tell a little bit about what you're going to be doing? 
I'm going to be watching Scooter. You're going to be watching Scooter. Right. What are you going to be looking for? Well, I'm going to be looking to see that all the, the milestones as we come around the heading alignment cone, I'm going to make sure he's on at the 180, the 180 degrees from so the runway. You're talking about the big turn that big we turn. made gonna make before we turn. turn final onto the land, onto right. the runway. He's going to let me fly a little bit, and I'll fly around that cone just he a little is? bit. Yeah, he's going to okay. light it up. All right. Bit. But then I'm going to make sure he's on his altitude, you know, 180 right, out from yeah. the runway and then 90 degrees out from the runway. Right. And then as he rolls on final, he's all in altitude. Right. Airspeed's right, altitude's right. right. We're getting ready to land. And if he's not, you're going to let him know. Then I'm going to give him some sugar calls. All right, okay. Which is, what are sugar calls? A little rise, a little up. All right. <laughs> a little fast, a little slow. Okay. You can do it. You're the man. Tomorrow is a big day for you. I mean, you've had all kinds of big days, but is tomorrow kind of the biggest day for very you at a moment? Very special. And that's because we're landing. We're landing. And you know what? The robot doesn't land. That's right. There's no auto land system here. People get to land. Right. You get to land. Now, I was looking at my numbers. I think I have something like 3,000 dives approaches okay. in that aircraft. 3,000 approaches. And those are all set up for the one you're going to do tomorrow, pretty much, yes. right? That one. <laughs> so there's a lot of practice that goes into this because this is a huge event. You're flying a spaceship and going to land it like a glider. Right. right? It's not it's only a glider. Right. It just doesn't fly very well. You can't catch any lift. Right. You keep coming down like, all the way. It's like a, a brick, right? Is that fair to say? Kind of like a brick coming down with these small wings compared to the size right. of the ship. Right. And you don't have any engines, which means if you don't like what you see, that's a big difference. In yeah. the Navy, every time I came into the ship, sometimes they'd be moving around or I wouldn't be right. Yeah. And they'd say, go around, try again. Yeah. Move the engines up and you're going up. And this thing, you know, you're coming down. There's no going around. You right. land. Right. So this is... You want to make sure you got business. the right stuff underneath you when you touch down. That's <laughs> very, very important. Can't say, no, I'm going to change my mind. No, I'm going to go over here or there. No, you're coming down. got to be in the right spot. Okay, there we, uh, we landed at Edwards. All our families were at the Cape, so it was not a, a positive. Um, however, my son was at Edwards, so I got to see my son, and uh, so it was great. And uh, this is our last picture with Atlantis. And I, I point out is we're all not standing very steady. And uh, they don't allow us to drive for a couple days uh, because of kind of inner ear disturbances, but, uh, but we managed to get the photo in. Uh, that's Atlantis headed home from Edwards on top of a 747 a week later. And then uh, we did give a chance to do the 40th anniversary with Apollo 11 crew, and uh, that's Neil in the center there with our crew. And I'll just show just a few release images, and then, uh, then we will uh, have some questions, some easy questions now. <laughs> I'm going for the easy ones. Uh, this is probably my favorite of the first images. It came out on September 8th. It's called Omega uh, Centauri. Uh, it's taken by Whitefield Camera 3 about 16,000 light years away. Um, there's about 100,000 uh, stars in there. And the, the red and the blue and the yellow, the yellow is like our sun, for example. And then you've got blue dwarfs and, and, and numbers of stars that, that tell, that are of different ages, if you will, uh, in, in terms of their lives of uh, you know, burning out or uh, uh, starting to explode, so different. Uh, clusters there. Uh, it kind of looks like Christmas to me, and it's one, the one I, I find the, the best. This is a star forming region in uh, Carina there, and um, this is in the uh, visible, visible spectrum, and Wildfield Camera 3 has both IR and visible now. It's about 7,500 light years away. And then uh, the next picture here is it in the infrared, and you can see you know, the stars behind that, so it's kind of cool. That's a capability we never had. This is the, the Butterfly Nebula. Uh, it is about uh, two light years away. Um, 800,000 kilometers per hour gas jet coming out of there. And you know what, I think this number is wrong. That two should have another number associated with it, but I don't remember what it was. But this is blowing out the jets of gas. Uh, Stefan's Quintet, uh, also with wide field camera three in the visible and IR area. The foreground uh, galaxy is about 40 uh, million light years away, and uh, 17, it took 17 hours to get this picture. 
So Hubble looked at one spot for 17 hours to get that, put it all together. This is a good example of the, uh, the STIS um, and what it gives you, and what it gives you is the constituents, uh, helium there and argon and all these other constituents in a spectrograph, and that's what uh, some of the astronomers use. So at that point, I think we're done, uh, and I have a presentation. And then we'll get into questions, easy questions. So we are very fortunate to have an opportunity for questions. So if you have your questions, please hold them, hold them up in the air. We've got staff that will assist in bringing those forward. Question from the audience. How do you feel about manned space flight to Mars? Uh, I think Mars is the answer. Mars is the destination. Mars is the only uh, possible destination that we know of it to date which could sustain life. So I think Mars is where we need to go. Uh, closest approach, 40 million miles, a little under 40 million miles. Um, it's about a nine-month trip there, nine-month trip back, and about a year on the surface. The challenges are um, getting all the life support to work and the, the radiation, but I, I definitely think Mars is where we should head. We may want to practice back to the moon, but Mars, um, this is my personal opinion, uh, we need the will of, uh, really, of all uh, everybody in the world to get together to try and work that. But that's a, that's a very good uh, effort that we should, should attempt. A question from a future Husky, age eight, Campbell, <laughs> asks, what does it feel like going into space? Uh, it's exciting. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, somebody asked me if I was afraid, and the answer is really no. The answer is no. I, I can honestly tell you a couple times landing aboard a carrier, I was afraid because uh, it was either get aboard or eject. Um, but this was, there's just, you're just too busy to be afraid or to have it. it. It's really cool because it takes a lot of effort to strap you in that seat, but then when you get on orbit, you know, you can just release your buckle and you can just float out, so it's pretty cool. What will limit the eventual life of Hubble? Electronics, meteorites, batteries, how long do you think it will last? Uh, good question. I think it's, the gyros are what fail the most. Gyros are a problem on Earth, and they're gyro, they are in Hubble, um, and they're spinning pretty fast. So um, we, uh, we say that we uh, don't warranty the labor, but um, I would think it'll last a good five years, uh, and then things will slowly degrade just like they have every time. And uh, it can physically be up there about till 2020. With, and before it starts to deorbit and decay. So um, we're, we're hoping for a good five years of science out of it. What kind of damage would a bit of space dust do to a spacewalker if encountered? If encountered, yeah. Uh, it doesn't take very much to hit a spacewalker to cause damage through the suit. Uh, so I guess uh, a very small piece of, say, um, paint chip going uh, the wrong direction at the wrong speed could go right through the suit, so that's a, that's a challenge. And uh, we haven't had that happen to our spacewalkers, but uh, we have had, uh, say, a Russian circuit board uh, piece of debris go through the, uh, the radiator on Atlantis on a previous flight. So we have had encounters with debris, and that's just part of the risk. What happened to all the parts that were removed from Hubble? Are they being tested? and what results were found? That's a good question. Um, COSTAR, the corrective optics that we had to do because we uh, ground the mirror wrong, um, is going in the Smithsonian as well as wide field camera two in Washington, D.C. So those items go into. Um, the uh, fastener capture plate um, that caught all those screws, those came back, they counted all the screws and everything was there. So. But a lot of stuff gets analyzed. How far can Hubble see? Uh, Hubble can see within a billion light years of the Big Bang, so about 12 billion light years back, if it stares for a long time. You referenced the interview or testimony in front of the Senate. Within the astronaut corps at NASA, with NASA being publicly funded, what do you think that we, as the American citizenry, should know about supporting NASA? 
And what's the internal conversation with you and your colleagues about public support? Um, I would tell you that, well, first of all, thank you for funding a billion dollar mission, because that's what it was. Um, I would tell you NASA is a pretty darn good payoff for the amount of money spent. Um, and, and I don't think you can fund space with the thought that the spin-offs, you know, are, are re uh, returned tenfold, which they are, I might add. You know, power tools, and you can go down a large list of stuff that NASA, that spun off of the space program. But that's not really the reason. I think exploration is the reason. I think you, you need to put money back towards your future, and I think, you know, the, our future is space, it's, you know, underneath the seas, the waters, lots of things. But you need to put money towards, you know, many different areas that are best for the country, and I think NASA is just one of those areas. Final question, what was the most unexpected thing that you realized being in space? <laughs> the, the most unexpected was how uh, spectacular the sunrises and sunsets were, and how the, the, the stars don't twinkle up there because there's no atmosphere, and how many stars there are, and uh, the beauty of the Earth is just beyond belief. So thank you for letting me go, and I hope uh, everybody gets a chance to go to space someday, certainly the kids. Well, I want to join Captain Johnson in thanking all of you for coming this evening and having you here this morning. Thank you very much.